Kia ora and welcome to Cultured Conversations. I'm Kirsten Paisley, Director, Toyo Tamaki, Auckland Art Gallery. This is part of a series of conversations that we're having with leaders throughout Aotearoa, New Zealand, about issues facing arts and culture organisations today, here and right across the world. Today I'm joined by a classic Kiwi success story, Andrew Grant, welcome. Thank you so much, Kia ora. Andrew is of course senior partner at McKinsey's leading the public sector advice department and a whole host of other areas of McKinsey's work with government, public and private sector. You're home now and confronting I guess a whole range of advice between both governments here in New Zealand and also in other parts of the world. Um, but you love Auckland a Rhodes Scholar that grew up, of course, in Onehunga. Worlds apart. Tell us about that, Andrew. Well, look, they are, but look, I, mean, I went to Onehunga High School, which I just loved and grew up, so I see myself as a South Auckland boy at, at, at heart. But it's interesting that for me, there's actually values and things that I learnt at Onehunga High School. The toughest business negotiation I ever had in my life was on the rugby field at Onehunga High School. So you know, the apprenticeship imagine. was actually you know, wonderful yeah. in that sense. But also we had, I mean, part of my passion for art is we had some art teachers that just um, were passionate about how art could n nurture and nourish the human spirit. And it was not, you know, Onehunga High School is not a wealthy school by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, we're mostly at the other end of the spectrum. Mm. But we actually had an art teacher and some principals that got access to a print collection. And actually forever, Onehunga High School probably has the best print collection of any high school in New Zealand, arguably many other institutions. And they found a way to make art accessible and interesting to all of us, you know, from the day we arrived as 13 year olds right to when we left. And there was something about these teachers that were passionate about not only art as it were as a profession, but just the way art could help your spirit soar. Mm. the way art could actually be relevant and speak into the issues of the day. Mm. And I must admit, I'm incredibly grateful for that gift that was mm. given to me at Onehunga High School. Mm. But also, I, I do think when the reason that often Kiwis do do well on the international stage is that um, you know, it also taught an incredible ability to get on with everyone. Mm. And in everyone you saw some, something wonderful. Mm. Uh, there's a quote ascribed to Winston Churchill, whether it was one of these things that Winston Churchill actually said or not, but he had a lovely saying that there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it's hard to know which of us ought to reform the rest of us. <laughs> and I think only Hunger High School taught me early that there's something magical in everyone. Yeah. And I, the more I think you progress, the more you go into leadership, learning that art to how do you actually find the magic in everyone mm. and stitch it together in a, in a wonderful way. So that's where for me, only hung a high school to, you know, doing reasonably well on the global stage. I, I actually think they're very interconnected. It's amazing, isn't it, how one yeah. or two people in a child's early life yeah can have such a legacy on where they ultimately end up going and the influence yeah. they then have in the world um, as well. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. And of course, um, there's a lot going on globally uh, um, at the moment uh, following the rights in America. Yeah. And we're starting to rethink how we understand not only our own personal past, but our nation's past yeah. as well. And, yeah. and that kind of brings us to you know, the, the role of collections in telling the stories of our nation's history, not only to um, educate the young and inspire okay. the creative mind right. within yeah. the individual, but also how we understand our own histories yeah. and of course the colonial narrative. Yeah. You know, a tough question perhaps, but um, one that's very current right now this week is the review of how we accept or utilise or manage yep. sculptures that celebrate complex and sometimes difficult historical oh. figures and Cecil Rhodes is yep. of course one of those. Yep. What's yep. your thoughts about the idea these statues should be brought down um, uh, and, 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 how, and, and how might an art museum or an institution navigate the, right. the recontextualisation of history? Yep. Look, I, mean, I think it's very difficult to generalise because I think there are some statues of bad people that should have never had statues in the first place. And they there's were, also they just bad, some yeah. bad sculptures. No, exactly, bad sculpture <laughs> and bad. And they should have never had a sculpture even back then, let yeah. alone now. So I think that that's one, one class. 
Um, fortunately, there are many, I think, great individuals that we've celebrated, and I think we have more of those than not in New Zealand. Mm. There are the Cecil Rhodes, which I think are difficult, because Cecil Rhodes was not a good man. But Cecil Rhodes created an extraordinary legacy. And actually, when you look at what he sought to achieve in the legacy, mm. I, I think there was, was magical. And I think that the legacy has gone on to even be more powerful. You know, if you actually look at the Rhodes Scholarship today, much more of the funding has not come from the original endowment, but mm. from what Rhodes Scholars have gone into. Mm. And I, I guess my view on the is using, um, and by the way, the Rhodes Trust, I think, has done an outstanding job of it. They've more actually said, listen, we had a responsibility before the legacy to create something great. Mm. How do we actually create you know, many more leaders from this part of the world? How do mm. we actually lead that conversation? So it's much more of a look forward and how do we correct and do the right thing, mm. not how do we look back. Mm. And I do think that, that, that the unfortunate thing I think about for particularly these individuals like Cecil Rhodes that were bad people that created good legacies. You might argue uh, Andrew Carnegie was not mm. dissimilar in terms of was mm. a bad person that created, you know, we wouldn't have libraries mm. arguably without Andrew Ka Carnegie. I think that, that and look, in my own view, is it's also about making the conversational more, the conversation more three-dimensional. Mm. I mean, I love the idea that the statue just doesn't become the statue, but is there a QR code that actually tells the broader story in a digital way, and it ends up being a, a moment to have the bigger conversation. I also don't think you can undo history. History is yeah. history. These figures, you can't just rub them out. They did exist. And I think provoking it to be a richer conversation. I also come back to where I start, for really bad people, I think they should go. I think the more challenging conversation is the Cecil Rhodes of the world, where it's a mixed conversation. Mm. It, it goes actually right to your quote from Winston, yeah. in fact, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. There's the polemic that, that we have to deal with. And, and here yeah. too in New Zealand as well, because you know now the conversation's populating the globe, we're all rethinking who it is that we heroicise in public spaces and the function of public spaces in terms of debate. Absolutely. And also the, the other thing is a little bit of our humility in our place in history as well. We don't have it all right either. So how will we be viewed in 100 years as well? Yeah. Some of our greatest philanthropists today um, actually destroyed a lot of firms in their corporate world before they actually became philanthropists. Right. You know, I think their philanthropic story is extraordinary. History might have a slightly different view on how they conducted themselves as business leaders. So that's why I think there's also a humility around our place and time as well. It's not that we're the one perfect generation. Yeah. It, it's an interesting hook you've thrown me then because, of course, yeah. this is a big issue facing art museum boards um, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about it because, of course, the Auckland Art Gallery has just established a dedicated uh, advisory support. committee yeah. with the support of Regional Facilities Auckland Board, yes. um, as you know. And so it's an exciting time for the gallery as we establish this important um, external leadership to support and nurture the institution yeah. going forward. But for some of the institutions you've been working with, and there's yes. a lot, I mean, you've been working with yeah. the Met, with the Louvre, with MoMA, places all over um, the world and really major leading institutions providing advice about how they actually navigate some of the complexities around the uh, constituents that represent and make up their boards yes. and their corporate lives. Um, can you talk us a little bit about um, what your advice has been, been on this? Exactly. Well, I think we start from a premise that liberal democracy is not having its finest hour when we look across the world and the traditional places that we've seen as the light on the hill, as it were, for the democratic world, they're not having their finest hour. Um, I therefore, and when I say I, you know, as an institution, we believe in the great cultural institutions, which you know, more often than not art galleries are at the forefront of that. For me, this is the moment that they actually have to shine. They actually have to carry more of the weight of what it takes to have a healthy liberal democracy. Right. Then may, maybe they could have been a little more complacent or have a, more of a back seat role historically. We need them actually to be at their best, given I think they play a very fundamental role in a democracy, but particularly when the other institutions are not you know, having their finest out. So that's the governing thought, that we actually think your role mm. in society is a much more prominent and a much more critical role than it has been historically. To play that role well, 
We argue there are three, call them balls, call them three worlds that you need to, to manage really well. Mm. And more often than not, those three worlds have been quite separate. Mm. We argue you need to pull them together and make them overlap mm. much more than historic. One of those worlds is financial stewardship. Mm. I mean, you need to be able to be, you know, financially, you know, have financial sustainability and also that it enables you to be more independent, mm. maybe than to your, um, you know, government masters, to your philanthropic masters, we actually think independence mm. and financial independence is quite critical. Mm. The second element is we do think, we, t we talk about curatorial distinctiveness. Mm. Now sometimes people mix that up with excellence, but mm. those institutions that you met, mentioned, they've all been excellent for many, many years. Mm. Distinctiveness is slightly different. And, and, and essentially we describe as what do you really stand for artistically? Mm. And we argue that you actually need to shove that a lot of collections, a lot of the way that you operate it, you've just been doing that the way you've been doing it for many, many, many years. And now as given the global world that we're in, a need to be much sharper around what do you really stand for and do you have the curatorial distinctiveness mm. around really enabling you to stand for something. Mm. Now our test around that a little bit is if, if you were to let me view the collection completely, mm. could I guess what you stand for from the collection mm. rather than telling me first what mm. you stand for and then having me view the collection. Mm. So that's the, the second piece. We just think the distinctiveness around your curatorial excellence, the bar's mm. gone up on that significantly. Mm. And the, the third and arguably the most important is what we call relevance. Mm. Now relevance has a number of pieces, a number of dimensions to it. One is just, you know, are you really engaging with society around the issues that matter to them? Mm. Climate change, mm. Black Lives Matter, mm. um, inequality, mm. um, poverty. The, I mean, the issues that really matter to a culture today. Mm. And secondly, I also think that, you know, when people come through the door, when citizens come through the door, mm. do they actually feel engaged? Mm. Do they feel that, you know, this has been a great experience? And, like, mm. and I also think another part of it, given we're in COVID, are you starting a little bit citizen back around what you're providing and what you think citizens need for this moment in time? So my own bias, I think citizens need optimism at the moment. Mm. I think we need a dose of looking at the stars and optimism and COVID's called, caused all of us, I think, to reflect a little bit more existentially on what matters in yes. life, what really is important as yes. citizens, as humans, as, you know, yeah. as husbands, as wives, as partners, as, yeah. you know, and, and I think that being able, do we, are we nourishing that sort of citizen back mm. or are we starting more from what we think is interesting as art professionals mm. and moving forward? Mm. So that's the third, are we really a relevant force in society yeah. or are we an elite institution that's become a bit decoupled from society? So those three, financial excellence, curatorial distinctiveness and societal relevance, we think are the three critical worlds. But more importantly, how do you make them overlap? I was going to touch on that yeah. because you, you talked at first about uh, the privatisation of the well, maybe that wasn't the word you used. <laughs> it, it was more about being the uh, financially independent, yes, I yes, think was yeah, the word you used. Financial stewardship. Stewardship. Yes. Um, but also there's an inference with that of a more complex model. You know, for Absolutely. example, yeah. uh, it's common in Australia and also here in yeah. New Zealand that you might see a third, third, third of yes. public, private and self-generated revenue yes. shaping around yeah. an institution. For us at Auckland Art Gallery, it's yeah. actually even a bit further in, in, in terms of private uh, philanthropic funding, we're sitting at around 45%. Yes, um, yes, and so yes. there, there is arguably a question yeah. around the privatisation of a public entity. Yeah. So that's one piece. When you yeah. then look at the questions around relevance to the broader community, yes, yes. how do you then, you know, you start to have some tensions naturally yeah. between the philanthropic partners that you're engaging with yes. and the desire to democratise the institution and see the visitation reflect more with greater equality the the makeup of the community generally yeah. um, and and that's when you start to get into some tensions particularly about what um, the the constituents of your board yeah. represent in their private uh, activities, yeah, right? Yes, and we've seen yes. some huge examples of this. So what's your advice there to institutions? Yeah. When do you sacrifice yeah. the dollar for the brand which is 
uh, um, unquestionably focused on a quality and access. Yeah. And I'm not clear. I mean, they're fantastic questions, and they're questions that don't have straightforward answers. C a couple of principles that we have. One is the tensions are good. The okay. tensions are actually healthy. So embrace the tensions, and more often than not, the collisions, the creative collisions around those tensions, is where you actually get the innovations and the great ideas. Well, it's certainly where so, you feel you're working hard. hard <laughs> in terms of this. So again, I think that often people, their kind of their initial instinct is to manage away the tensions and don't. But I think the tensions are really healthy in terms of it. And look, one thing that I just give with, you know, one of the tensions around the Met, for example, is that, you know, it, it ran into all of these tensions in a, in a big way. Part of the conversation, and I remember one of the workshops that was really quite tense, was actually just realising that one of the big problems is that we just weren't getting people to the spaces that they, that they could be, and we weren't actually being um, innovative in the way that we were levering. So, for example, the best parties in New York now happen at the Met. Yes. You know, and, and at one level everyone thought sort of, that's, you know, prostituting this institution. But they've actually done it with such professionalism and with such fun and such chutzpah mm. that it's massively enhanced the reputation of the Met as now becoming the mm. place mm. that you engage. So it's made it more relevant. Mm. It's made it more financially, you mm. know, independent. Uh, and I'd argue that actually the curatorial creativity that came to bear in those events has actually now sort of actually had a, a, a secondary sort of playback into the way that they actually mm. curate journeys mm. around the Met more broadly. Mm. So that's why I'd argue the um, one the kind of growth, all of our kids are being taught these days, the growth mindset of tension mm. is good. Mm. Um, but I also think that the old trade-off world, that it's, you know, kind of these are all trade-offs. Mm. I, I don't, I, I think that's a bad mindset because I, I think there are many more ways where we can actually get the two to act Together. in unison. And things. For example, with mm. democratising and making something more available, I do think if citizens pay for something, mm. more often than not, that's actually quite a good discipline on whether or not you've got a product that citizens want to engage with. Mm. Now, clearly, you don't make it at a price point that it's not accessible. Mm. Um, you want to make it accessible. Mm. Um, if we look even to rugby, which I know, you know, mm. what, what, what we've seen with mm. Aotearoa, mm. Uh, you know, they've actually made it work brilliantly with a different price point, yeah. that all of a sudden, you know, the crowds and the engagement is, is different. Yeah. So that's where I'd, I, for me, there's many more of those worlds that actually can overlap and come together. Mm. Uh, not that they have to be trade-offs and the like. I do have this one point about where I come back to financial stewardship. For me, I, and look, not every institution, but there are institutions where if you are overly dependent on one philanthropist or one particular public sector funding, I do think that you lose your independence to do what you think is right. Mm. And I, I do think this principle of doing what you think is right and being independent mm. around that is really important. Mm. And I also think it, if there's ever a challenge, um, starting with the citizen and actually saying what's right for the citizen and how mm. do I best engage the citizen, mm. I also think is the principle. Too often the citizen just didn't figure no, it's about managing a PR issue or, yeah. you know, those kinds of issues. Um, should an art gallery, in your mind, take a position on social issues yeah. um, in the heat of that moment? Or is it really through yeah. the program that you're articulating the role of the institution and the need of the citizen? Yeah. I, I Look, this is a personal view. So an, I personally don't think that institutions should take strong positions. I mean, unless things are just blatantly obvious about, you know, so I think if it's a, if it's, so for me, something like Black Lives Matter is blatantly obvious about mm. the right side of history you need to be on. I think some conversations that are complicated, like climate change, mm. um, we think in New Zealand, climate change is a little bit more straightforward than climate change is in your own country in terms <laughs> of where you need to be, but it's a tricky conversation. Yeah. And therefore, I think an institution should more be a curator of the conversation and making sure the right voices are being heard in a respectful, interesting, provocative way. Mm. I think that's much more interesting than the institution thinks X. Yes, yeah. And it can mm. also run the risk of looking yeah. a little bit tokenistic, for example, a party on a single issue, yeah. you know, or an event on a single yeah. issue, as opposed to actually actively representing um, 
in our country, Maori curators and artists actively in the program. A a absolutely. And I also think the conversations you probably should be leading into are by definition complicated and complex. Mm. I mean, genetic editing. Mm. in many respects. It's an incredibly complicated conversation that I think New Zealand will be forced to lean into. Mm. But it's rich. I mean, what does sustainability really look like mm. uh, going forward? Climate change and all of the inequality. And I think inequality is a fundamental conversation for our time. Mm. Uh, so I, I think though, leaning into those conversations where by definition, I think it's very difficult to have a black and white, we think A or B. Mm. But the rich voices, and I think in New Zealand we're very blessed that we've got very rich voices mm. in and around many of those fundamentally you know, critical conversations. And I, and again, this is the parochial Kiwi that probably thinks that we have a station in life that maybe is beyond what is the reality. I think we've got an opportunity to lead the world in finding a way, can we create some digital platforms and avenues where the conversation that we are having mm. is a conversation that's being reflected globally. I mean, I, in the work that I do, I always come home, and these days I come home virtually, to being really proud about the nature of the conversations that we're having and the way that we're having the conversation vis-a-vis mm. -vis some other parts of the world. Well, and I think small nations in general are, are actually at the forefront of having these conversations in a much better way. And we can be, I guess, because it, as you touched on, the digital world enables us to amplify right. a conversation yeah. like this, this one to the world and in a way that um, people are now wanting to listen and in yeah. fact turn towards the South turn Absolutely. towards yeah. New Zealand for its cultural achievements and particularly right now through COVID. Um, Absolutely. I thought yeah. it would be good to talk a bit about programmatic issues in the COVID environment because yes. Yes. Um, uh, you know, at start, the start of the year at the Auckland Art Gallery, we'd just announced five major international exhibitions. It was a new direction. We were wanting to bring international art from the world mm -hmm. yeah. to New Zealanders who couldn't necessarily travel um, and make sure that the very best art of the 20th, 19th and 20th century yeah. saw its way to our shores in the first half of this century, you know. Yes, so we were yes. on this kind of yeah, new program yeah. mandate. Yeah. Um, that's obviously gone out the window and we've yeah. pivoted and taking a very different tact going forward now. Yes. Uh, but, you know, at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, there was a sense that this is a short term issue. Yep. Yep. You know, we'll all be back on, exhibitions and collections will be travelling the world, museums and galleries abroad, you know, yep. desperately depend on the loan revenues from the touring of their collections. They yes. put them to hard use yes. And, yes. and you've got small institutions with extraordinary cultural treasures yes. and national treasures uh, that, they, that are no longer able to lend. What's the advice that you've been giving um, art galleries abroad about international yes. programming and the exchange yeah. of collections? Well, one thing overall we would say, a philosophy, we think COVID has been an amplifier and an accelerator of what was going on anyway. And in many respects, when you try and move from what you're doing to the new world, and, and I, I think, Kirsten, just the boldness of the program that you were doing was just exceptional in the New Zealand environment. But I, so our view is that, but more often than not, when you move from the existing to the new, mm. there's always trade-offs around how we're going to cannibalise what we were doing. It's a painful transition. Our advice has been this is the moment to be bold because COVID just pro provided a break mm. and a need to reset. Mm. And therefore, you know, a lot of our advice is really view COVID as that amplifier and the accelerator of what was happening anyway. Mm. So pull forward the future. Mm. Because in the end, your budget's shot anyway. Um, so <laughs> trying to make it 5% better, it's not going to be, it's yeah. going to be 100% worse. Yeah. So just actually, and look, the Prime Minister's got this lovely saying, build back better. And I do think we all have to rebuild. I think we all have a choice about do we build back better or do we build back what we had. Mm. And th I think there are too many people in cultural institutions that are yearning for 2019 yeah. as opposed to, that, yeah. to trying to get back to it, as opposed to saying, this is the moment, let's pull forward 2030. Mm. And, what, and by the way, I, I don't say that in a trite way because I know that that will also require some pain and some change, yeah. but it's worth it because the future was coming anyway we've now just on an accelerated path. Mm. So that's the, the one bit of advice. The second bit of advice is innovation, is ex that the innovation that COVID caused, I don't think people quite realise, um, months became days. 
yeah. in terms of what people were able to just all of a sudden figure out that we couldn't travel. So mm. how, and certainly in the business world, there were just extraordinary examples of that incredible agility mm. of just responding to a, a new reality. Mm. Um, the great cultural institutions of our world are not known for their agility and their ability to have a metabolic rate that works. And we have this saying that's not ours, but we've COVID speed. Mm. And I think that we all learnt COVID speed when mm. we were in COVID. Mm. I think there's now a need to make sure that the innovations that we make around, because some of the challenges that you raise, mm. it is, you know, unstoppable force against a movable object. Mm. And normally, you know, how would you resolve that? Mm. But I've just been staggered on how people are actually coming up with really creative solutions. Mm. And then the th second thing is that there's a great English publicist, G.K. Chesterton, that had this lovely saying that creativity is finding a great idea and then forgetting where you found it. Mm. And I think at the moment, a little bit of utter humility around, yeah. we will beg, borrow and steal yeah. good ideas from anywhere. Yeah. And I'm not saying this to you, but some of those names that you mentioned aren't known for looking in other places for great ideas. Yeah. And I think we're being confronted that the great ideas are typically coming from fringe institutions. That's right. And actually being humble to actually look in those unexpected places for some of these great innovations to resolve those ideas. I, I've been looking at um, times in my yeah. own career, but also in the 20th century, when yeah. we've seen enormous constraints on museums. And, yeah. uh, you know, amazingly, it's the Second World War when we saw yeah. um, National Gallery of London, yes. for example, send all its treasures to the regions Absolutely. and yep. then bring one work back yep. at a time during the blitz yes. you know to share with the public yep. and so even that as a concept one work masterpiece exhibitions is kind of oh. something that institutions are looking at making our own collections work harder really celebrating digital uh, contemporary practice sound-based practice performative practice which we can get into the country with um, some greater ease than you know vast crates and um, and the like of our master nice. works collections so you're thinking about different media which is actually already in step with the way yeah. living artists are already working um, nothing like a constraint to, to, to absolutely to yeah. generate creativity yeah. and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I spend a lot of time in regional Victoria too, and some of the programs that you see generated out of regional places have the most extraordinary innovation within them due to the fiscal constraints that people are working in and the tyranny of distance as well. Absolutely. Look, one thing I'd also just throw in with COVID, all of us have spent more time with epidemiologists than we probably wanted to yeah. at this time. But the one little insight that I just think is extraordinary, the, the problem with viruses mm. is from a, a, a biological perspective of any organism on Earth, mm. they have this incredible advantage that they have enormous surface area for their organisational bulk. Mm. So they have a way to have extraordinary reach with mm. very little organisational energy. Mm. And I, I actually think there's a real learning in that for institutions around yeah. how do you build this incredible reach and touch mm. with less energy. And I'd love to see the collect. I mean, I gave, we started with a conversation around Only Hunger High School. Mm. I mean, how do we think boldly about getting the collection out there? I, I've shared ideas in the past about mm. I'd love to have the collection at our, there's a lot of talk about the border at the moment. I'd love, there are now some mm. institutions that are putting their collection in airports. Yeah. That it's the first experience you have as you enter a country. Mm. I'd love to have the collection on the road. Mm. I'd love to have the collection digitally. Mm. I mean, maybe in lockdown facilities, it could actually be the one sort of yeah. positive aspect of New Zealand life that they see. But to your point that COVID's given us an ability to just think differently and boldly around some of those different things. Mm. But I, I also think from the perspective of democracy, uh, democracy is going to demand that institutions have more surface area mm. and have more relevance than they've ever had historically. Mm. What a beautiful point to end our conversation today, Andrew. Thanks Thank for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. This has been a cultured conversation led by me, Kirsten Paisley, Director, Auckland Art Gallery, Toyo Tamaki. You can find out more online at aucklandartgallery.com or use our hashtag and keep the conversation about culture going on in our community because it's so important right now.